Okay, everybody, we've got a whole lot of learning going on here tonight. Uh, first and foremost, how do you feel about what happened to you yesterday? Pretty good. Good. <laughs> could, could we elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> Come on. Help me out here. Well, we, we already, we talked about the fact that there are now, um, the elect. Yeah, the elect, the elect. so. No longer catechumens or candidates. No, right. No, no. So, yes. we kind of talked about that in, in a little bit, so. Okay. We didn't go into a detail, though. Anything stand out? <laughs> I always look to you, you know. I know. <laughs> because you're the talker, that's yep. why. You know, that's that means you're, you know, you're a leader. <laughs> it means you're a leader. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. They always pick on the talker. Okay. This is one of the few times in my entire life. Uh, because yesterday I was a bishop for 20 minutes. Um, that, and when I confirm I'm a bishop for 20 minutes, and then it's over. So I do not let it go to my head. Uh, it's the first time in living memory that we have not welcomed the uh, catechumens to the right of election at the cathedral uh, in a thousand years. Um, so, uh, at least within my recollection, um, which is not a thousand years. Um, but uh, I really like the idea of doing it in the parish church rather than sending people up to the cathedral to do it. Um, because let's face it, the parish church is where the action is. Um, so I, I, it was just outstanding. Um, uh, I, I was a happy camper all day. Yeah. Uh, it was the right thing to do and it was just, just great. And uh, Krista and Corey were perfect. Um, they did not make loud animal sounds during, <laughs> the, during the sermon. <laughs> Uh, well, I have to say, we didn't have that happen either. Yeah, and they, and they didn't throw missilettes at the priest. Uh, it was uh, it was really good. Uh, they didn't bring um, their uh, comfort peacocks with them. Uh, I was <laughs> grateful for that. Um, yeah, it was, and we even had some people uh, in the congregation, which was really good. Uh, so I was I was delighted. Um, I've been asked to, to talk about Lent, uh, since we're in Lent, and it's important that we pay attention to this season. Uh, you have some handouts on Lent. Uh, it's excellent tank reading. Um, look over that information. Um, Lent and what you're doing has been a part of the church's experience since the fourth century. Uh, up until the time of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, there were various means of uh, experiencing Christian formation. Uh, in most instances, uh, Christian formation lasted anywhere from one to three years. Uh, so it was a colossal investment of time. For most of those first 300 years of the church's ex existence, uh, catechesis and formation uh, were primarily an urban experience. Uh, the church began in urban areas. Um, 
mo began with Jewish settlements in urban areas in the Roman Empire. And that was important <clears throat> because in Judaism, uh, Judaism has been called the religion of the book. And so an essential feature of Judaism was that you had to be able to read the book, primarily the first five books of the Bible, of the Torah, uh, the five books of Moses, but all of the prophets and the writings and the hist historical uh, writings as well. So Christianity uh, in the first three centuries was noteworthy for its literacy and because it was an urban phenomenon. And as an urban phenomenon, it had from the beginning what uh, people on the left would call today diversity, but not just for looks. Uh, the Roman Empire was a huge uh, territorial uh, experience embracing many races, religions, uh, and parts of the Mediterranean world, and even outside the Mediterranean world. Um, and so consequently, the church was very diverse, multilingual, uh, multiracial, uh, embraced the rich, the poor, uh, free people, slave people, um, and instruction in the faith uh, invariably included literacy. If people didn't know how to read, they were taught to read. Um, and various translations of the Hebrew scripture, both in Greek and in Latin, uh, were done in part over those 300 years, but to get the whole Bible into uh, Latin, which was the growing language of the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, uh, it took St. Jerome. Uh, Pope Damasus the first sent him to the Holy Land because he was very difficult to work with. And he lived in a cave and translated the scriptures from the original languages into what was then modern Latin. And St. Jerome had texts in front of him that we no longer possess. And so his translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Latin uh, was a landmark experience and is a version which scripture scholars still refer to uh, as a version that reproduces information from texts we no longer have. This urban phenomenon, this literacy, this universality, uh, the word Catholic was used to describe the church because it embraced everybody um, and is used specifically in the Nicene Creed of 325 AD. And about the middle of the fourth century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem founded what we would call the rite of Christian initiation for adults. Uh, he centered it around Easter, particularly this, the, the, the great fast, the 40 days before Easter. Um, and those 40 days became <coughs> extremely important because it was during that season that those who were inquirers and had become catechumens were advanced to the elect. These were the people who were going to be baptized at the Easter vigil, would be chrismated or confirmed, and would receive the Eucharist for the first time. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem 
was the pioneer of this, and he was so successful with it that it was adopted throughout the Western Church and much of the East as well. Um, the purpose of this experience was not just to convey information, but above all was to integrate the individual totally into the Christian experience. And so we have one of the first great experiences of assimilation in world history. Uh, there were countless numbers of people in the Roman Empire who were ruled by the Roman Empire, but like the Jews in Palestine, they did not consider themselves to be Romans. And the remarkable experience of catechesis <clears throat> and especially uh, the approach of St. Cyril of Jerusalem was to assimilate all of this diversity into a single community to bring into existence what St. Paul said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and works through all and is in all. Um, that was the goal. And the ecumenical councils of the church, which began with Nicaea in 325, demonstrated the consciousness of the church to teach authoritatively in the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is capable of keeping his promises. When he promised that he would send the Spirit to teach us all things, he did that. That we would be able to know the truth. He did that. And the ecumenical councils of the church made it clear that there is only one faith. And so, uh, when the Nicene Creed was written to combat the errors of the, her of the heretic Arius, the council included a profession of faith in the church. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, uh, that there is no buffet Christianity. Uh, there is the church, and then there are people who want to be like Christians. Um, and it's important for us to recognize that, that uh, there were people in the third century, just like there are today, who will say it doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as you're sincere. False. Uh, I'm sure that Jeffrey Dahmer was perfectly sincere in violating, murdering, and eating his victims. Um, that doesn't make it right. We're going to talk about that tonight, too. Uh, <coughs> so, what you have experienced, uh, and what you are experiencing and will experience, is part of an ancient experience. Um, that because it involves new people will be and has been forever new. Um, you are not making this journey alone. Uh, that is why these experiences like yesterday are done in the presence of the community of faith. Um, the community endorsed Krista with applause yesterday. And that means that she's. this is not a self-help group. This is a part of a family of shared experience. And so during the season of Lent, your role is very important here. Uh, you are a sign to those who were baptized long ago 
<clears throat> that we continually need to renew this experience. And the season of Lent is a yearly experience when the whole church basically goes on retreat to examine the fundamentals of our faith, to examine how well or how poorly we're living up to them, and gives us a season of encouragement to find better ways of giving witness to our faith. Um, and to do so in an adult manner. Uh, cradle Catholics are used to the idea of giving up things for Lent. Uh, I can remember uh, in the fourth grade, uh, Sister asked us uh, what we were going to be giving up for Lent. This was expected. And there were the usuals. We're going to give up candy. We're going to give up cookies. We're going to give up movies. But it was Mary Beth Flower who astounded the whole class. There were gasps when she said that she was going to give up television. No one believed that was possible, um, even back in 1957. Uh, that's fine for the kids. But these are things children will take up again after Easter. My mother was one of the most amazing people I have ever met in my entire life. Both she and my dad were smokers. My mother would give up smoking for Lent. And she didn't turn into Godzilla um, or the Wicked Witch of the East. Um, she was pretty normal. Um, I, I was just astounded and still am. Um, I can't do it. Um, since the Vatican Council, we have been urged to look at Lent in a grown-up way. Not what we're going to give up for 40 days. I always pride myself on telling people that I'm going to give up skydiving and street luge <coughs> for Lent. <coughs> but um, the council and the scriptures urge us to take a more adult approach and the gospel reading yesterday was so brief and yet so important uh, St. Mark records that the spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness Greek word is the same word that's used for driving cattle. And this simple word tells us that the sacred humanity of the Lord Jesus in, uh, experienced the same kind of reluctance that we experience when confronted with things that we're told are good for us. Um, it's the same kind of reluctance that formed his agony in the garden before his passion uh, that he was fully human and going out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil an experience that is elaborated in the other synoptic gospels but Mark says that he was in the presence of the wild beasts and angels ministered to him. That even in the presence of the wild beasts, heavenly aid was immediate to him, as it is to us. The second thing about yesterday's readings uh, gospel reading is that Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God and the first word out of his mouth repent repent 
The kingdom of God is at hand. Reform your life and believe in the gospel. Repent comes from two Latin words meaning to think again. Uh, it's a, a, a reflective exercise. To repent means to think again about what is important, how we treat what we think is important, what we do to preserve or obtain what is important, and to rethink about how this is shared with others. To repent means to think again about our relationships. Do we treat others as we wish to be treated ourselves? Fundamental precept. Repent. Think again. What are the things that we're striving after? Are they merely for our comfort, for our pleasure, or for a certain amount of prestige or bragging rights? Or are we concentrating on the things that will last? How do we know what's going to last? Only the things that bring us happiness. That's what the fundamental drive of human beings is. To be happy. Certainly there are instincts that need to be followed. The instinct uh, for food, shelter, clothing, uh, safety, okay. Um, but how do we arrive at those things so that it will include happiness. And the gospel tells us that we only get to be happy to the extent that we share. Not just the necessities of instinct, food, shelter, clothing, security, <coughs> but the rest of goodness and how do we find goodness? By being taught. Uh, we are born with an inclination toward God. How we attain that, we have to be taught. And Catholics are remarkable. I don't know of anybody that spends more time in the school of virtue than Catholics. We spend a tremendous amount of time learning, being taught how to recognize, name, and point out what is right and good and true and just and beautiful and loving. And we spend a remarkable amount of time being taught how to recognize, name, and point out what is bad and false and evil and selfish and destructive. We are taught not only verbally, but by example, that it's worthwhile to make sacrifices, to bring what is right and good and true and just and beautiful into our life on a daily basis. We call these experiences virtues. That the life of virtue is what the church is about in its public experience that this is the school of virtue this is why we hold the saints up as examples not just pieces of interesting information or famous people in history they their struggles 
with the challenge of a relationship with an unseen God and how they formed their life around what is right and good and true and just and beautiful and loving has much to teach us. And the season of Lent urges us to willingly be a part of the school of virtue. For grown-ups, it's not about what we give up, except when we choose to give up our old, tired sins. The bad habits that get in the way of becoming our best selves and revealing what is best in ourselves to others. We all know people who have bad habits. They're the things that drive us absolutely crazy. We don't understand why people just don't see what's going wrong with these repeated behaviors that drive people nuts, that get them into trouble. And that is a cautionary tale. And the season of Lent is our opportunity to not just perceive the vices of others, but to think about our own performance. Uh, the most valuable thing that we can do during this season is give up our old, tired sins. Why? Go back to the ultimate ambition of human life. Because we're happier when we do what is right and good and true and just and beautiful. And the remarkable thing about the school of virtue is that it cannot be hidden. Jesus himself says that we are going to be a city on a hill. Can't be hidden. That we are going to do what the Lord Jesus himself did. He only had two tools to work with, persuasion and attraction. And virtue is like a magnet, and it draws others because they see goodness in our actions and give praise to our Heavenly Father, as the Lord Jesus himself said. Persuasion. People will ask us why we do what we do. We need to share that with them. We don't make any headway if we tell people what to do, unless they specifically ask, what should I do? The most important thing we can do is share what works for us. And in most situations, we draw people closer when we tell them not what they should do, but when we share what works for us. Our most successful phrase is, Here's what works for me. Or, I've had success with this in the past. And when we talk about death-dealing vice, bad habits that not only attack the spirit, but also attack the body, like drug addiction and alcoholism, um, and lying. Um, people can find a sense that they don't have to 
continue to be harmed by these self-imposed uh, uh, tortures. But there is a way out. And we may not have all the answers not necessary. What we are called to do is to ask the right questions. You know, and this is about parenting. You know, parents uh, are responsible for having all the right answers, but there's a point where the children have matured to a particular level of understanding and the role of the parents is no longer to have all the right answers. The role of the parents turns into mentoring and mentoring is all about asking the right questions. Um, and that's the school of virtue. That's what we are called to embrace during the season of Lent. Um, it's not about what we give up unless we are going to give up our bad habits, our vices. Uh, it's not about the expectation of candy at Easter or Easter eggs. Uh, does, does anybody know why we have Easter eggs? In the Christian East, they don't have Ash Wednesday. They have Sundays that lead up to the first Sunday of Lent. The first one is Meat Fair Sunday. From that point until Easter, they don't eat meat. The second Sunday is called Cheese Fair. No dairy products, no cheese, no milk, and for some reason, eggs were considered dairy products. So the reason why we have Easter eggs is that people in the Christian East would decorate eggs because after the Easter, uh, after matins of Easter, when the celebration of the Lord's resurrection began, they could have eggs. And that's where Easter eggs came from. <coughs> I have no idea where the Easter bunny came from. I don't think the <laughs> Easter bunny has anything to do with Lent or Easter for that matter. So, one of the things that Catholics traditionally do, and which they are commanded to do by precept, uh, is to go to confession sometime between Ash Wednesday and Trinity Sunday. So it goes beyond Easter uh, for this opportunity, at least once a year, minimum. And my constant uh, concern throughout my priesthood has been to encourage people to do this more often than once a year. Um, my traditional agony every Christmas and Easter and Lenten season are people who come to confession and will tell me it's been a year since they've been to confession. I, oh, God. <laughs> and so I give them a rigorous penance something that they must do uh, in order to secure true absolution and forgiveness. And people who have been away for a year, uh, I give them this penance. In fact, most people get this penance. And I ask, do you have a calendar at home? Do you have access to a pen, a pencil, or an orange crayon? Yes. Are you able to count to 12? Yes. Good. For your penance, I want you to put all of these things together. I want you to go home, mark your calendar. You pick a date for yourself sometime in the next 12 weeks. That's 90 days, three months, 
summer, fall, winter, spring, when you will get yourself back to confession and let your confessor know how you're doing. It must work because I have lines. Mm. Um, the importance is not just the moral rigor of the Christian life. The importance is recognizing that confession is not something to be feared. that the experience can be fun. And how do we define fun? It's an experience that enables us to laugh at the absurd. Things that we would not ordinarily do, that we would not ordinarily experience a kind of a random circumstance, like when you open up an email and someone has sent you funnies, and you laugh. Sure. Why? It's about sharing an experience of something that is not something we experience every day and is a part of the absurd. And one of the things that we grow to recognize in our spiritual maturity is that sin is absurd. Why? Well, we go back to the book of Genesis. Whoever wrote Genesis was a superb psychologist. God tells Adam and Eve, Everything in this garden is yours except the fruit of that tree. Touch that fruit, you're going to die. And so the tempter appears. And very suavely says, Did God really tell you not to eat the fruit of that tree? Eve says, Yes. Because God said, God, who's able to deliver on everything that he promises, said that if we touched or if, if we ate or touched that fruit, we're going to die. Now the devil, who has never built anything but only destroys, insinuates himself between Eve and her God and says, Oh, that that's not really true because God knows that if you eat that fruit you're going to know good and evil and that's going to make you God and so the fundamental weakness is not disobedience the fundamental weakness is what followed Eve saw that the fruit was good to eat and desirable for the knowledge that it would confer. What did she do? It's called rationalization. It's how we sin. We turn an evil into a good and choose it. We are unable, we are hardwired. We cannot make a decision on behalf of something that we do not perceive to be good. We cannot choose something because it is evil in itself. This is known as the fallback position. We have to turn it into a good. We have to rationalize. Eve rationalized. She took the fruit. She ate it. She gave it to her, Adam, and he ate. And as scripture says, 
Then their eyes were opened, and they saw that they were naked. What does nakedness con con uh, convey to us? You're completely helpless. I mean, think about the people in Texas. The only thing that could be worse for them would be if they were naked. Think about that. <clears throat> so what did they try to do? They tried to cover it up. God was not fooled. Walks in the garden in the cool of the day and says, where are you? Finally, God finds them hiding. Why are you hiding? Well, we're, we were naked. We hid ourselves. You have eaten then of that fruit that I forbade you to eat. There are consequences. Get out. And so we've been on the periphery trying to find our way back into the garden of happiness ever since. And as Jesus says in his dialogue with Nicodemus in the, in the Gospel of John, God so loved the world that he sent his only son to reconcile the human race with their creator. And that's our focus during Lent. Um, and it's also our focus as Christians. Um, we, one of the consequences for us is that we have to explain why in order to understand how to choose better. And that's what the Sacrament of Reconciliation is all about. It is a matter of supernatural indifference to me, personally, what a person may do. My role as the priest is not to be a buddy. My role as the priest is to first and foremost do something that most people never encounter, and that is to be asked, why did you do that? Who was the last person that asked you that question? Probably mom or your spouse. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Um, and we have to be able to account for that not explain it away, but to recognize the rationalizations that get us in the, get in the way of us doing and becoming what is right and good and true and just and beautiful and loving. Uh, so rationalization was the first sin, not disobedience. Rationalization made the second sin possible. Because without rationalization, disobedience would have been imp impossible. Eve said, well, God told us we, we can't eat that fruit. We can't even touch it. Precept. And the tempter came and seduced her into rationalization, and she fell for it. And so did Adam. The consequences need to be faced, and if we don't like the consequences, we have to change the behavior. If you do what you always did, you'll get what you always got. That's what they tell us in AA. Um, and so if we want different results, we have to choose different behaviors. And Lent is full of invitations and opportunities to do better. And the Lord Jesus loved us enough to make this spiritual direction personal. We get to come in just ourselves and the priest. 
who not only receives our confession, but if he's a good priest, he's going to give us some spiritual direction. Try this. Um, I always tell people that, you know, here's what I suggest. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, come back. Tell me I'm all wet. We'll try something else. Because what I'm looking for is improvement. The goal is not perfection. The goal is to get better. Perfection is not something we achieve. Perfection is bestowed upon our best efforts. And that's what makes the striving worthwhile. So Lent is a season of opportunity, not deprivation. Lent is a season when we are reminded that God treasures us because we are imperfect and continually draws us to himself because he knows first and foremost, about everything that is right and good and true and just and beautiful. So we want to be in his ballpark, definitely. Not just to observe what he does, but to learn from what he does. Um, the greatest coach in the whole world is Jesus Christ. Um, he's rigorous, but loving. He demands improvement, but knows that only he can bestow perfection. And that you need to indicate that you're interested in that. Interested enough to make sacrifices. Yeah. Any questions about Lent? Uh, yeah. Bill? Yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. yeah, you can you can still you can you can still give up uh, roller derby and street luge if you like. <laughs> I, I, I know that you've given up uh, skydiving. Uh, and I'm I'm really grateful for that. Uh, yeah. What, what do you got? What is the exact reason that we eat fish on Fridays and not meat? Um, I mean, why do we do that? Um, it's a corporate thing. <laughs> it is. It's a corporate thing. The church is a family. It's a body of people. And think about the bodies of people you belong to. There are things that you do in a corporate manner to express that membership. There are things that you do that are linked not just to what you do, but when you do it, why you do it, and with whom you do it. Um, everybody does this. Uh, I suppose the best example of this corporate expression is Christmas. Think about it. It's everywhere. Even before Labor Day, it starts creeping into our experience. And we have airheaded, vacant celebrities lecturing us about the true meaning of Christmas. And they don't mention Jesus Christ at all. Uh, Christmas is meant for children. No! Christmas is meant for grown-ups. Why? Christmas is a season of giving. False! Christmas is a season of learning how to receive the gift. Um, 
we're all caught up in this and the the tinsel and the and the lights and the decorations and the trees and the and the presents uh, are a part of it but they are not the essence of what's going on here. And that is why many people are depressed at Christmas time because they're disappointed when they hear tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And they're not experiencing any comfort, much less joy. And that is why we're here. Our corporate expression reminds people of the meaning, the purpose, and the results. You know, the, the, the reason is not presence. The reason is gift. Presents are expected. Gifts are not expected. They are unearned, they are undeserved, they are unmerited. They are the expression of love, and that's the difference between a present and a gift. We abstain from meat products on Fridays because the Lord Jesus died on a Friday. And it's a way of interrupting the habit of our of our lives to make room for the Lord Jesus and that's one of that's the challenge of the Christian life overall but especially during Lent because it leads us to the foundation and focus and fundamental fact of our faith and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead um, so yeah uh, it's a corporate thing people who are not Catholic even Catholics make fun of that um, and there are countless comedy routines about Catholics and being mackerel snappers for instance um, but um, it has a purpose it has a meaning and above all it's personal. It isn't just a thing that we do. It's personal. It's about a person. And the impact that this person ought to have on our lives. And this is one of the things we do as a body to demonstrate that this should have an effect on our lives. Yeah. Uh, we cannot go to Burger King after the football, after the basketball game. <laughs> Why? Well, we're Catholics. We can't eat meat during Lent. Um, wonderful. Yeah. That's what I learned about public education. Now we can't go. We can't go to Burger King. Or no, there was no Burger King back then. It was McDonald's. And go to McDonald's after the basketball game because it's Lent and it's Friday night. And you can't eat there. Didn't they have fish back then? Yeah, they did. They were fish sandwiches from the beginning. Wow. And we couldn't eat meat on any Friday. So it was after the football game, too. Can't go. We can go to McDonald's, but we have to order fish sandwiches. Oh, it used to be not just during Lent? Yeah. Yep. All year long. All year long. No, that's okay. what we did. How long ago was that? When did that change? 1963. Okay. Vatican oh. Council. It was wonderful. I had a driver's license then. It'd take about seven people, <laughs> eight people in that big 1962 Mercury convertible. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Uh, drive to the football game in North Olmsted and then drive back to the only McDonald's on the west side of Cleveland on Lorraine Road in Fairview Park and we would disgorge from the car we'd have to top down maroon and white crepe paper over everything and um, uh, we'd see people from nine other high schools there and it was just amazing um, fish sandwich yep um, why did I tell you that I don't know. <laughs>